All right. So this is our first lecture on CSS. This is going to be a very basic lecture on CSS. We're going to teach you the introductory stuff that you need to know um, to be dangerous. The stuff that you're going to learn next week uh, from David is much more advanced and more in line with kind of the stuff you're going to be seeing throughout the rest of the course. This is just meant to get your feet wet and kind of see what some basic styling techniques are and things that you'll be able to do in order to jazz up your um, your applications just a little bit for right now. We're going over the basics. We're going over very, very simple stuff today. So don't be intimidated. Um, I know that CSS, some of you probably feel the same way that I do about CSS and that it just takes forever. And you maybe you don't have a, a good eye for style or design. I'm in that boat. If I need to, like, I can do it, but it just takes me forever to do because I'm just not, it's just not my, I don't enjoy it. And um, if you're one of those people, the first thing that you need to do when you're in this class is find yourself a David Stinson. Uh, find yourself someone who you know is awesome at it and learn from them uh, because that's what, that's what you're going to need. That's what you're going to need to get you there. Um, some people just have an eye for it. Uh, a majority of your IAs uh, are amazing at styling things. They're very design minded. They just, they see what things should look like and just make it happen. Um, I, I'm just not in that boat. I just, I find it difficult. I dislike it, everything about it. It's just tedious and whatever, but we have to teach you how to do it. Right. And you have to know how to do it. You have to know it, right. Whether you like it or not, you have to know it because you're going to be doing it. So, um, yes, there we are. Now we've discussed my feelings on CSS. Um, everyone always teases me, by the way. The IAs all tease me because I'm not very good at styling. So when I share things with them, it's they're like, wow, Ben, the styling is awesome. And yeah, it's good, good times. Marquise, what's up? Uh, we don't need to make a, a app.js, do we? Um, we are not going to need a JavaScript file for this lesson. So uh, we're going to learn how to use styles, uh, well, add styles to a web page. We're going to learn about multiple ways to do that. We're going to talk about CSS selectors for targeting elements, and we're going to write some very basic CSS rules. So let's go ahead and go into our lectures directory, uh, code SEI lectures, and we'll make a directory called intro to CSS. And we'll touch index.html. And we'll touch, well, we need to make a directory, CSS. And we'll touch style.css. And we'll open that in VS Code. Oops. Wink. OK. And onward to the lesson. Andrew. Yeah, just for clarity's sake, is our is our um setup question the same as our attendance question for can we usually get one after lunch? I'm just double checking. The setup is just a check to make sure that you've got everything set up and are ready to go with the lecture. That's for me to be able to say, okay, I can go on. Uh I still need a handful of people to do that before I start with the lecture. The attendance question that is posted in the uh squad chat is for our IAs that are taking attendance. So you're gonna want to make sure you click on both of those things. Yeah, we only oh. have one. Don't have one in the backyard. That's all just okay. Okay. Still waiting on a couple more people for setup. I've only got 68. Minus my one is 67. And there are more than that of you in the class. All right, that's a little bit better. Cool. Um, does anybody have any setup questions? I want to make sure I ask that before we move on. Cool. Let's do this thing. Okay. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Um, CSS was created in the early 1990s uh, while this person was working at CERN. Uh, I had no idea how to pronounce that. Um, so I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, before the intro of CSS, developers had very few options for kind of managing what their websites look like um, because it would depend on what browser the user was using. 
Um, CSS kind of gave developers a way to separate the content and the structure from the design uh, in an application and, uh, and separate that from its presentation. So what the elements actually look like. Um, one major innovation helped CSS win out over its competitors in the 1990s. Um, cascading uh, is really what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, cascading is a pattern used to handle conflicting rule sets when determining what an element is supposed to look like. And you're going to see, we're gonna cause some conflicts today as far as or the different rules that we set up. And you're gonna to get to see which different method of styling will win in a fight, so to speak. Um, in 1996, Internet Explorer became the first browser to support CSS, uh, obviously with wider adoption following soon after. So um, let's talk about what CSS is. Um, we know a little bit about it. You had to do a little bit of it for your pre-work. Um, it's a web technology used to format and style HTML documents and provides stylistic behaviors using CSS animations. We're not going to talk a ton about animations in this class, but there's some really fascinating stuff out there. So I highly encourage you to like look that up if it's something that interests you. Um, CSS enables us to separate, the, like I said, the structure and the content from its presentation. So we talked about that little picture with all three parts, with the JavaScript, the HTML, and the CSS. And your, uh, your like the bones of your application is going to be your HTML, right? That's your structure. And the content, some of that lives in the HTML. The ability to do stuff with that content is your JavaScript. But what that content looks like is going to be your CSS. Um, this concept of separation concerns is widespread throughout software development because it helps make programs more maintainable and provides better code reuse, which is something we're really going to hit hard once we get to uh, building applications. We don't want to repeat ourselves. Uh, if we have a piece of code that you see a couple different times in an application, likely you're going to turn that code into a helper function or a, a method somewhere so that you can call it multiple times so that you're not writing the same thing over and over again. Um, and CSS is very similar to that. We're going to come up with some rules that will apply to certain components so that we don't have to write, okay, I want this component to look like this. I want this component to look like this. If, if the comp component meets a certain set of criteria, we're going to style it a certain way. And that will apply to all elements that match that criteria. Okay. Um, don't expect to be awesome at CSS when you first start out with it. Um, it's just, it's something that takes time to get better at. And again, some of you are going to be more uh, stylistically able than others uh, when we first start out, but all of you will be fully capable of producing things that look great by the end of this course. Uh, let's talk about some basic CSS terminology. Um, we're going to be using this terminology extensively. I mean, this is, you, when you talk about CSS, you have to know what all the different pieces are. So that's really a great place to start. Um, this entire thing right here is called a CSS rule. A CSS rule is made up of each of these different parts. You have the selector, which is shown here in orange. And the selector uh, is going to have a set of curly braces here. And those curly braces are going to contain a list of declarations. A declaration is a property combined with a value. The property is going to be the CSS property that we are adjusting, the style property. These are going to uh, directly correlate to the style properties you saw from the web API style object when we talked about those earlier. Usually when talking about that stuff, it's easier, like people have seen some minimal CSS first, so it's easier to kind of say, okay, when I'm looking at the style property of, um, you know, uh, something in the DOM, it correlates to this CSS property. But the, these things are directly equal to those. Uh, obviously, there's some difference in how they're defined. You can see here that we're using kebab case, whereas we used um, lower camel case when we were talking about the style objects in the DOM earlier. But the names are essentially going to line up. You just have to adjust them for the, the, their casing. And then the properties here have values associated with them. Think of it like a key value pair, right? You're going to have some sort of property that's going to have some sort of value, which makes up a declaration. And a set of declarations will make up a selector. Well, we'll go inside of a selector. So what this is doing right here is saying, the CSS rule is saying that 
I want all of my H1 elements to follow these rules. Rules. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? Just basic terminology. Okay. So there are some actual definitions here. Um, I just kind of gave you the lowdown, but we'll go over this here too. Um, selectors used to target the element to be stuck. I'll scroll up so you can see this a little bit while I'm doing this. So selectors are used to target the element or elements to be styled and range from simple to incredibly complex. Multiple selectors can be specified, in which case commas separate them. You will see that uh, in this lesson. Uh, there are a few hundred CSS properties that can be used to style color, size, text, position, border, animation, and more of elements. Um, those are the properties. The values, uh, the value to apply it to a property is specific to that property. For example, the CSS property font family accepts uh, values of names of fonts, such as uh, Georgia, Helvetica, et cetera. Uh, other properties might have numeric values uh, or a type of unit assigned to them. Uh, for example, if you're setting a border, of, uh, uh, yeah, a border of something, it might have a width of five pixels. And we're going to talk a lot more about what those different ranges are in future lectures. Um, we're just going to stick to some basics for right now. And then the declaration is the combination of a property and a value separated by a colon and ending with a semicolon. This semicolon, this is one of the few, few places we've seen so far that if you do not have your semicolon, your code will not run the way it's supposed to, if it runs, if it even runs at all. Um, you have to make sure that you put these semicolons here or your code is going to break. The most common error that we see with intro to CSS stuff is forgetting to put the semicolon. So please, 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 if you have an error, the first place you should go look is your semicolons. Okay. Um, some basic, again, intro to CSS properties. Uh, you can see here what uh, content padding and margin look like. Um, you're going to see specific examples of this as we move on, and you're going to get to play around with it. Um, Really, the, the best way to learn CSS is to just get your, get your hands dirty, dive into an application, throw some HTML on a page, and just start screwing around with it. Give some stuff, uh, you know, classes, IDs, whatever, things that you can select them by, and just play around with it. Um, we're going to give you a couple resources throughout the course of this, or the, throughout the, um, the lecture here and throughout all of our CSS lectures. And usually, we're going to tell you when we come across the good ones, like, hey, you need to have this bookmarked. Um, CSSTricks.com, I think it's called, is like, that's one of your CSS Bibles. Like, if you don't already have that bookmarked, when we get to it down here in the lecture, please, for the love of God, bookmark it. Uh, it has so many useful tips and tricks in there. Um, there are tools for, like, if you want to center something on a page a certain way, it's like, okay, start with this. Is it a block element or isn't it inline element? Is it this or is it this? And you pick all the criteria and it tells you exactly what code you need to do to center your thing the way you want it to. Very, very helpful tools, especially while you're getting to know this. And um, another thing that we're going to be doing is giving you guys some little practice utilities afterwards to play with this. I like to gamify things. I think that when it's a game, it's much more entertaining to learn. And uh, we have a couple different versions of like web-based games that will help teach you CSS. Um, one of them is just a generic one, one's for Flexbox, and uh, one of them's for Grid. So we'll, we'll show you those when we get to them. Uh, David just threw that there in the lecture chat. Just, I want everyone to take 30 seconds and go bookmark that, please, right now. I'll just wait. That is your CSS Bible. I was looking for a CSS Bible and I found Catholic sculpture study Bible instead of the website that we needed. Yeah, that is not what you want. That will not help you with styling. No, I was like, mm, that's not exactly what I was what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So let's keep going here. Um, we'll talk a couple uh, about a couple of these little properties here that we're going to be playing around with today. Um, you're going to use a lot of different properties related to fonts. Um, we're going to talk about some of the popular ones. You've got your font weight. That's just going to be the essentially the size of the font. So whether it's bold or normal, whatever. Uh, font size is how you adjust the actual 
size of the text on your screen. Uh, one of the ways anyway. Font family is what font you're using, right? And we're going to show you uh, in future lectures how to adjust that, how to download fonts using Google Fonts and whatnot. Uh, and then color, obviously, is just the color of the text. Uh, margin is another frequently used property that adds white space around an element. You can see up here in this little chart that if we give something a, mar a margin, it is going to exist outside of the element. So the element we're talking about here is this dotted uh, rectangle in the middle. If I add margin to it, it will increase white space around the element. If I add padding to it, it will increase, it, it'll add white space inside of the element. Um, I was joking around with David about this before the lecture. And really, like the CSS lecture could just be reduced to two sentences. Everything is a box. And if it's not a box, it's a box that probably exists within another box. And that's really just what you need to know. All the rules about CSS just have to do with what boxes go where and what the boxes look like and what the boxes do. So that's kind of how we'll talk about it. Um, when you are adjusting the white space using margin, you have a couple different options. Uh, we'll talk about some of those during this lecture as well, but uh, you can adjust the margins individually like this by specifying which margins you want to adjust. Obviously, top is top, bottom, right, left. Um, we'll show you a shortcut for that here in a little while. Padding, again, adds space between our content and our border. So if we go back up here, we have our content inside of here. When you add padding, it's going to add space between that and the edge of uh, whatever component it is or whatever element it is we're talking about. So if you were to put a border on your element, it would go on the outside edge of the element. Whereas if you increase the padding, it would take your content and shrink the content down inside of that element. Um, shorthand properties, very useful when specifying CSS. Uh, properties because you're able to write things more concisely. Um, the example that we showed you above with the margin, where we have margin top, margin right, margin bottom, margin, you don't ever write that out that way. There's a shorthand version for that. Um, you are able to write just margin and then specify uh, top, right, bottom, left. And if you need help remembering that, it's never eat shredded wheat, right? No. Or just clockwise, because that's easier, right? It's whatever you want. Um, another thing to note here is that if you were to use zero in any of these values, you wouldn't want to put the pixels. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But realistically, I, I don't think it would break anything yet, but it will break things down the road if you don't put the little pixels next to each of those things. Notice there's one semicolon at the end not after each individual item. So this would be the short, shorthand for setting a margin of 10 pixels on the top, five pixels on the right, 15 pixels on the bottom, and 25 pixels on the left. Okay. Some more documentation here about shorthand properties, should you be interested in it. So what we're gonna do now is, um, we want to do this in groups or do we want to just do this everybody by themselves? Probably just everybody by themselves, right? I'll just call on a couple random people. I like that idea. Um, we're going to give you five minutes and you can visit whichever of the following references you'd like. Go to this one and learn more about a couple different CSS properties. When we come back, I will randomly pick about three of you and you can tell me what you discovered. Sound fair? Cool. I will start a timer. And the things that you're going to look for here are what the property styles, usually going to be pretty obvious because names are usually pretty logically set, and some of the values that can be applied to the property. So be looking for these things. And in five minutes, I will randomly call on three of you to share what you found.
You're on mute. That would help. Thought I clicked the button. Fabian, share with us what you found. Uh, I did the transition delay. Okay. Um, I, it pretty much just delays like what transition you want to go on. You could either declare it by like seconds or milliseconds. Um, and a comma separated list of time values for, de for defining separate de delay values on multiple transitions for a single element. So you could do like a bunch of um, different elements on one line type of thing with comma separated by the delay. Um, okay. And you also need to do like the, the WebKit transform and the Moz transition delay for like just different browser types. Cool. So what's something you might use that for? Um, in this example, they do it for like a, like a little do you, pop Do you want to share your screen? Show us what you're looking at? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so for this one, they did like a, a little transition bar. Cool. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then you just need like this stuff right here or um, all your different browser compatibilities like this, like just transitions. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool, that's pretty nifty. A little bit more advanced than what we're doing today, but nifty nonetheless. Cool, uh, next up, Joseph, share your screen, show us what you found. Joseph here. Joseph's, really Joseph's internet went out. Gotcha. Okay. Well, lucky Joseph. Next up, Jeremy H. I'm going to move some windows around. Hold on, I was on, I was on mute. I'm moving some windows around so it's more readable when I share my screen. Cool. Okay. Two. The ones I mainly looked at were the um, line clamp, which I was interested in. So basically, it just sets a maximum number of lines before it just terminates into into ellipses. If I'm understanding that correctly. Cool. And then um, I was curious how to just set images of background. I know that's a simple one, but yeah, how to do that instead of setting a color for a background. That's fantastic. That's a good thing to know how to do, especially when you're yeah. going to be using, well, some of you will be using backgrounds for your games. When I saw that memory card game, I immediately was like, oh, I want a um, card table background instead of the white one. <laughs> so that's what I was immediately trying to figure out. Sweet. That's fantastic. Nice work. Let's do one more. How about Sarah? Um, I will share my screen. Um, okay, so I went kind of simple and just chose font size. Um, there's actually like a ton of different ways you can put in font size, which is why I wanted to look at this one. So I guess it takes like absolute keywords and those are related to some actual size of the font. So you can use these ones. Um, there's also relative, so like larger and smaller compared to the parent size font. Um, same thing with percent values. So you can base it on the parent size font. Um, and then EM units I found, basically it's like also based on the parent element, but it's like one EM down here, you can see would be the 16 pixels that is the parent element. Two EM would be doubling that, so it'd be 32 pixels. Um, so yeah, that's what I found. Excellent, excellent stuff. That is all gonna be 
uh, very, very useful for you down the road. You're going to learn more about that in subsequent lessons. So cool. Looks like y'all had a good time doing that. All right. Let's keep moving on here. So we are going to, can you guys actually see that? Is that big enough? Like the lecture stuff, like this stuff? I'm looking at it on a second a little monitor. Bit. It just looks a little small. small. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little bit better. Okay. So we're going to go over three different ways that you're able to style your web pages uh, in this lesson. Uh, the first is inline styles. We're going to talk about external style sheets, and then we're going to talk about internal style sheets. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. You can use one or more of them on the same web, uh, web page, and they will definitely conflict with one another. And sometimes you want to put things in certain places so that they load in a certain order. Um, so we're going we're gonna to play around with this and see what the differences are between these. Um, an inline style can be used to apply styling to a single element using the style attribute which we've kind of talked about a little bit before. You've seen a little bit of this. Um, using inline style breaks our separation of concerns though by mixing it with presentation. So we really want to try to avoid doing this unless we have a real good reason to do it. Um, uh, you're not going to see us use this very often. Um, several JavaScript libraries and frameworks like Angular add inline styles dynamically to make them work. Uh, React even encourages using inline styling uh, with components dynamically. Uh, but in general, you're rarely going to see this because there are better options. Um, but let's play around with it, right? Let's go ahead and put up some boilerplate HTML here. And let's go ahead and go live with that. And let's go ahead and put some content in here. So let's do an H1 that says intro to CSS. Should see that pop up, beautiful. And we'll put another H1 beneath that or not, maybe an H2 typo. H2 that says three ways to add style. I'll, just, I'll capitalize it. Okay. So we've got each of these two items here, okay? If I want to use inline styling, what I can do is inside of this H1 tag, I can use the style property or attribute rather, write style equals, and as a string, I can write color green. And you'll see that that gives me the color of green for this text. Easy enough, right? Not the preferred way to do it. And we're gonna see how this conflicts with what we've got elsewhere uh, once we start using some of the other things. Also, another thing to note here, we used a named color. Um, certain colors in CSS, you're able to use just by naming them uh, or using the name that has already been provided for them. Um, I do that a lot just because I don't like looking up exact actual colors of things. Um, cornflower blue is a good go-to color. It's very visually appealing. Um, but you can use the named colors like that. There's more reference uh, material on that here if you want a list of all the named colors. Uh, there's some fun color names out there too. Um, the next option that we're going to talk about is external style sheets. Um, this is typically considered best practice because it is the best method to separate our concerns, right? Our presentation is the CSS stuff. That's how our, our app is going to look. That is completely separated from the rest of our code in its own separate style sheet. The um, uh, Hunter's making fun of me in our instructor chat right now for saying cornflower blue is a good go to. So, yeah. Um, the, uh, where's I going with that? Separation of concerns, right? That's what you want to do for everything in this course. You want to make sure that every different thing that you've got 
for presentation is in one place. All of your CSS is going to live in one place. All of your HTML is going to live in one place and all of your JavaScript is going to live in one place. That's why we have the directory structures set up the way we do. It's just, uh, it's just best practice and it's going to allow you to uh, reuse your code most effectively. So to do that, we're going to make a CSS sheet. We're going to call it style.css. In fact, I believe we did that during the setup. So it's right here. But in order for us to use that, we have to add a link so that our CSS is loaded into our HTML. Because if we don't put that link, our rules aren't going to be applied to any of our components or elements rather. So let's go down here. We could put this right beneath our title. We could probably rename this to CSS basics. Right beneath this, we're gonna use a shortcut. Now, I'm not gonna type that link out by hand because that would be crazy. We're gonna write link. And if we go down here, go to CSS, we hit tab. You'll see that what pops up is relationship style sheet, which is what we want. And there's an href here. The problem, who can see the problem with this? Need the folder? Yeah, we have a directory for CSS which has style.css inside of it. So we're going to delete this. And if we put a slash, we'll see the auto menu, like autocomplete pops up, right? So we can go into that CSS directory and hit tab. And we see the name of our file. So we hit tab again. We know that it's going to be linked properly. Anybody have any questions on how to do that? Very, very important to use that shortcut. Yes, Zuri. Um, when I was setting up, I did not set up, I don't think, a separate folder for the CSS. I might have skipped a step. Okay. And so you don't need to put the CSS directly okay. in. I just wanted to make sure. Yep. You will want to do that for your project, though, and most of the lessons moving forward, just, again, to keep your code organized. But totally fine. Ilya? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Why can't we put the CSS file on the same level as our um, HTML and JavaScript? Organization. Um, you're eventually yeah. going to have potentially multiple style sheets and having them in a separate a separation of concerns again. That's what everything's going to boil down to. Having all of okay. your um, files regarding CSS in one directory is going to mm -hmm. be best practice. And again, for ah. your... The basic stuff that we do, I think the most we're going to use is like two style sheets. Um, mm -hmm. And that's if you're using the CSS card deck. Otherwise, it doesn't really, it's, I, it seems kind of silly now, but when we get down the road to more complicated applications where you've got like a dozen style sheets, uh, it will make a lot more sense then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kareem? Um, well, why do we use H H href uh, equals to the CSS file? Um, I thought that was like for a link or something. That's what we're doing. We're linking to the file. This is just saying, hey, this is the location of that file. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Already. Let's make sure it worked, right? Sanity check. Let's figure it out and make sure we did something right. We have an H1 here, right? We have an H2 as well. But let's go ahead and try our H1. And we'll use our curly braces. And we'll put a rule in here. Let's say color blue. What's happened? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Is it conflicting with the HTML color? Let's try this. Inline HTML. See if I make that an H2, it works. That inline styling that we've done is taking precedence over our style sheet. So we're going to have problems with that. So let's leave that as H2. And I'm actually going to change that over here. So that we can actually see that we can see that conflict happen there, right? Um, Kareem, do you still have a question? Yes. Um, so when I was setting up, I think I kind of like did a mistake. I had uh, the HTML and the CSS both in the same folder. 
Okay. Uh, is that a problem? Do I need to like go back and change it? Because I try to. You will need to change it. Go ahead and pop that in the um, lecture support channel, and one of the instructors will get you taken care of. Okay. Cool. Um, so now we've talked about two of the three methods, right? We've talked about inline styling that we used right here. And we talked about external style sheets, which, which we've connected here. The uh, inline styling that we've set up, you'll remember, is overriding what we have in the external style sheet. The inline style is going to take precedence over this. And that's because the CSS is loaded starting with that external style sheet. But when we get to the HTML, it's saying, hey, apply this rule right before you uh, put the element in the DOM. So that's exactly what's happening here is we're getting that precedence, that order of uh, the load order matters. That's what everything boils down to in CSS. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, other types of styling and why when you use things like Bootstrap and you use a CDN link, you have to have your things in the right order or else you might have some unexpected results. Anybody have any questions so far? I haven't really gotten into anything super complicated yet. Um, the third technique that we've got access to is called internal style sheets. Um, this is essentially adding a style element inside of the head of the document. So if we were to go back to our HTML here, uh, can you want to mute whoever is not muted, please? I can't see who it is right now. Um, if we go over to the head of our HTML document, what we can do is we can put a style tag. And inside of that style tag, we can specify a rule like H1. And let's say color red. And again, we're getting overwritten, right? Because of that inline styling we have down here. If I were to take this away, you'll see that we do get that red. So which one takes precedence over or between the internal style sheet and our uh, external style sheet? Internal. 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 Yeah. Right, because it's red. Right? So your order of precedence, which one takes the least priority? External. Right? And then comes internal. internal. And then inline. Inline. Perfect. Yes. It's just level of specificity, Ben. It's load order. Those are the way, th that's the order in which they're loaded. And that's what everything boils down to with how your CSS rules are applied. Load order matters. If you remember one thing from this lecture, remember that, well, two things. One, everything in CSS is a box. Number two, load order matters. Those are your two big takeaways from this lesson. Um, put that back. Oh, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Cool. Okay. Oh, look at that. Hey, next big bold point here. Load order matters. Ilya, what's up? Uh, yeah, quick question. So can we put a link uh, like to link our style CSS uh, in the body? Um, if you, the head? you would want to put it in the head to link to it. But I mean, so if we put this link after we created H2 element, so it means that the blue color will be applied, right? Because it's like loaded the, the last, like. Well, let's see what happens if we try that. I, I mean, yeah, that's one of my. Why not? Let's see what happens. Uh, you wanted it where? After we cure it. Yeah, here. Okay. Um, it doesn't change anything, right? Well, we right now we have it set to apply the style Ooh. to the H1. But what happens if we made it an H2? But let's yeah, see but, if we but, but, let's but see I if we add an H two above that and see if I think I smell what you're stepping in here. Let's. Uh, this is the first H two. That's three times. 
That is three times. I know I can't say it for the rest of the course now. I used up all my, all my uh, uses for that one. So it is loading it and it's technically applying it. Oh, no. I think this is what you're asking. Yeah. If you put it yeah, down yeah, here, yeah. yeah, it's not going to do what you're thinking. It's not going to do anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another example, where is it? Just move it down, see what it does. Right? It's not going to hurt anything. It's just CSS. Cool. Um, so sometimes you're going to need to include multiple CSS pages on your site, uh, multiple CSS style sheets. Um, the easiest example I can give you for this is Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap is a very common third-party CSS framework that we're going to use a lot during this program. Uh, and to use it, we have to include a link. And because we have to use a link, we're going to put it up here in the uh, head of our HTML document. The order that we put those things is going to matter. And if we put Bootstrap before our own custom CSS page, all of the Bootstrap rules are loaded, loaded and then all of our role, uh, rules are loaded immediately after that. So if there are rules that we've set, they will take precedence over the rules that Bootstrap has set. So being cognizant of where those different links are in your uh, in that head of your HTML is it's very important. You have to know which one is which, which order they're in, or you're going to end up with conflicts that you don't want. Darnell? Yeah, are we going to need to uh, download the Bootstrap program, or are we just going to pull the reference nope. sheet? Okay. We'll just use the CDN. It's a content delivery network link, and we'll show you that once we get We have a whole lesson on Bootstrap, so cool. uh, it's actually a pretty awesome lesson. To, uh, yeah, I, I came Taylor across, Swift and Kanye West. So Yeah, I came across Bootstrap a few years ago. I was like, man, this is awesome. But oh, I'll just wait. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to see some fun stuff. Dave, what's up? Yeah, so with um, the specific implementations of CSS taking priority over each other, you, um, this is, I guess this is kind of referencing back what you're saying before, we should be focusing on, or should we be focusing on external style sheets yes. more so that there's not the conflict of interest of the different type of styles appearing in HTML files and different CSS files. Yes, uh, you're still going to have the different CSS files. You're still going to have to manage that, but you don't want to style like this, and you don't want to style like this. Okay, these are not not what you're going to want to do. Separation of concerns. Keep your CSS stuff all together in one in one separate place. You're separating them. And that's exactly what we do with the external style sheets. All of our CSS just lives here. Cool. Thank you. Cool. The only reason we have this in the lesson is because we show you what, what those different methods of doing it is. We don't necessarily recommend those. Darnell, do you still have a question? Or you just okay, cool. All right, time for some questions here. Uh, I'll read them off, then we'll pick some random folks here. When there's a conflict between internal and external style sheets, who wins? Who wins between style sheets and inline styling? What are the three approaches to add styles to an HTML document? And which method is considered best practice and why? Okay, so the first one, when there's a conflict between internal and external style sheets, Boots, do you have a question? Yeah, I guess <clears throat> before I before you go into those review questions, my I guess my question is if you have several style sheets in, in a directory that is a style sheet, um, how wh which which style sheet would take precedence if both are in style sheets? But... So if if you had this, like say you have style.css and say you have style1.css. Hardstarter.css, which looks like Yes. This is a whole thing that'll make cards show up on your screen if you style them as divs. If I need to link that, what I would do is inside of this, I would put link and I would put slash CSS 
card starter. And so now I have the access question to with the order of the links. The link, the first link is going to load first, therefore it takes precedence. Correct. Well, okay. no, the, the one that takes precedence is the one that loads after because okay. the load order matters. Makes sense. Yes, so. it's, it's the order that they are listed here. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, all right. Here we go with the questions. When there's a conflict between internal and external style sheets, who wins? I'm also going to get rid of that so that doesn't affect our code. <laughs> Justin. It is, uh, crap, I had it, I had it. <laughs> uh, it is internal. It is internal, correct. Yep. Who wins between style sheets and inline styling? Ty. I'm sorry, which question? Uh, who wins between style sheets and inline styling? Style sheets. You sure? Mm, well, <laughs> if you ask that, then no. So take a look here. Remember, we did this inline styling here. And no matter what we did to that H1, whether we changed it here or whether we changed it here, that green always took precedence. So inline styling will always take precedence. Okay. Cool. All right. What are the three approaches used to uh, add styles to an HTML document? Renee. Uh, the three approaches, um, there's inline styles, external style sheets, and internal style sheets. Beautiful. And finally, which method is considered a best practice and why? Yorgos. Uh, to have a separate style sheet like we do. Right, which is the referred style to as, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, external. Beautiful, thank you. Awesome, nice work. Anybody have any questions on that before we move on? Let's take 10. Be back at five past. All righty. Let's keep on moving. Um, so CSS selectors, what we're going to talk about next. As shown earlier, the selector portion of a CSS rule is going to target an element or elements to be styled by the property value declarations. Um, so what we're going to do to practice this is we're going to use some of this, uh, or we're going to use this little chunk of HTML. So go ahead and copy this article. I'll do it like you guys have to do it. So we're going to copy that, and we're going to paste that into the body. So right inside of our body here. We're just going to go right over our H, what we had in there, and we're just going to paste. And that should format everything for you nicely. And your screen should look like this. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of our styling that d conflicts with the methods that we're going to be teaching. So let's get rid of that inline styling, and um, we don't have an inline style on the H1 anymore because we got rid of that. So let's delete that. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and go over to our style.css, and we're going to adjust some of the properties here. Andrew, what you got? Hey, Ben, uh, what was the last thing you just said to delete? I deleted something from the lesson. You're good. It was just oh, a, okay. a typo. Cool. cool. So your page should look exactly like this. If you have something other than this, let me know. We literally just copied this right here, this HTML into the body of our uh, HTML document there. David? Uh, my intro to CSS is not blue. Do you have a, we're, I mean, we're going to overwrite this in a second, but 
Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. I did cord flower blue. Uh, blue. Nice. Just want you to know. Such a pretty color. That card starter file that you have in there, we're not going to have that, right? Uh, yeah, don't worry about that. That was okay. just. Okay, I thought me. I zoned out for a second. Yeah, no, that was just me demoing how to link a, um, another CSS file. You don't need that. Okay, so let's clear out our style.css. Edwin, what you got? Um, for some reason, I don't know why. I feel mm -hmm. like I have everything you have down. I just can't see my intro to CSS and none of the things that you have. Okay. I'm going to copy and paste my, well, let me get rid of this because we don't need this. I'll go ahead and copy and paste the HTML here in the lesson or lecture chat and see if that fixes it for you. Go. If that doesn't work, let me know. Okay. So we have this set up. We're going to talk about each of the different properties we have here, whether they be classes or IDs as we go through the rest of this. Um, but let's go ahead and go into our style.css and let's add the following rules. We're going to have a rule applied to the body where we're going to have our font family. And we're going to set that to Helvetica. Oh, I did that automatically. Helvetica, Tahoma, Verdana, and Sans Serif. This is essentially a hierarchy of fonts. And it's saying, look for Helvetica first, if the browser supports it. If it doesn't, look for Tahoma. If it doesn't, look for Verdana. If it doesn't, look for any available Sans Serif font. So this is just kind of like a, hey, try this. If that doesn't work, try this. If that doesn't work, try this. We're going to talk more about fonts in a future lesson. Then notice what happens to our page when we do that. If I comment this out, it looks a little bit different, right? It's because we've just adjusted our font. Then let's add an H1 selector. And we will text align center. That's how we move our content to the center of the element, text align center. And you can see that if we use the inspector tool here. There's our element. There's our text in the center of it. We're going to have a big old talk about how to center things and how to organize all of your CSS rules so that your content goes to where you want it once we talk about grid and flexbox. Anybody have their any issues getting their page to look like this? Cool. So now let's go ahead and play around with some of the different selectors. And you're going to learn multiple ways to do this. Uh, there are a bunch of different things you're going to learn in this lesson, and you're going to learn a bunch of other really fancy stuff next week with David. Uh, but let's start with some of the basics. If we wanted to select all H1 tags and H2 tags, we can use this syntax. We could write H1, comma, H2, and we would apply whatever rules we wanted like that. Okay. Knowing what you know, about that and what we've seen so far, what I want you to do is I want you to set the margin on the body element to zero on all four sides. This is something we're commonly going to have to do because of the way that browsers give us a margin on the body element, uh, which we usually aren't gonna want. So I want you to set the margin on the body element to zero on all four sides. I want you to give the background of the body element a color of light gray and a view height of 200 pixels. I want you to set the margin on the UL elements to zero on all four sides as well. And I want you to set the text color of all div elements to blue. Okay. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do that. And then we'll come back. Sound good? I will see you in 10 minutes.
I'm not sure how it relates exactly to pixels, but once you start using it, you'll notice how it responds to the browser, the size of the browser, like your browser window. Okay. So I think that the, I think that a lot of some of the confusion here is around the wording of this. Um, and specifically like how we're giving this to the body element. Um, essentially what it's asking you to do is have the height of the body be 200 pixels. Um, so you, there is a view height unit, but uh, that is measured in percentages. Um, so that wouldn't really work in this uh, case. So what you'd want here is just to give it a height of 200 pixels instead. Okay. I'll adjust that too so that that's more clear. Yep. And oh, you already, already did. did. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Darnell, do you still have a question? Yeah, I just thought about something. We set the body to... Uh, a margin of zero, but also set the UL to a margin of zero. But a UL is inside the body. Is that not considered repetitive, I guess? You're going to have different margins for different elements. That's completely normal. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Christopher? Yeah, well, uh, just going off of the height question, like I noticed if you set the height to a 1,000 or a 2,000, the the list and the other elements are kind of like within the body. I'm just wondering why is that? Why aren't they like pushed down? Um, if you take a look at your HTML, you'll see that they are in the body. I'll show you that here. So because you have oh, yeah, that's all of this stuff in the body, if you make the body taller, you're not necessarily moving any of these components around. You're just making the body taller. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, yeah, that okay. makes sense. Cool. Uh, Ilya? Uh, yeah, so my question actually was the same as the uh, as, uh, Darnell's. Like, uh, if we put the margin zero to the body, so it's not inherited by this UL element, right? But like, how do we know which uh, properties are inherited and which one are not? Like, do we need just to remember them, or there is like you have uh, a description of tool some... and your inspector? So if you use this inspector tool uh -huh. to select an element, you can see what is inherited from what. So you're inheriting this from the uh -huh. body. Yeah, this is, this is your best friend when you're doing your CSS stuff because you mm -hmm. can see exactly what's inherited from what. what it shows you what, your, uh, what the content is, what the padding is, the border, the margin. It shows you all this stuff inside of your dev tools. Okay, but is there like any a rule why something is inherited and something is not? Yes, we're going to talk about that at the end of this lecture. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep, it's part of the lesson. <laughs> cool. Actually, I'm going to leave that open. Cool. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this here, just for anybody who missed any of that. Uh, we're setting the margin on the body element on all four sides to zero. So we can just do margin zero. If we wanted to set the margin of just the top and bottom and or just the left and right, you could use two values. So if I wanted a top bottom margin of 10 pixels and a left right margin of 15 pixels, you could write code that looked like that. So this would be the top and bottom. This would be the left and right. Just another little shorthand trick. Oh, oh that asked us for zero. Okay, then the background color of the body, we want to be light gray. So background color, gray, and a height of 200 pixels. And then it asked us to set the margin of the UL element to zero. And it asked to set the text color of div elements to blue. 
div. Uh, that was text color, right? Color blue. And then our divs turn blue. Okay, I'm going to copy and paste that just in case anybody needs that. And we can keep moving on. Uh, so the ID selector. Whenever we want to select something by its ID, we have the option of using the ID selector. And we've sort of seen this before, right? We use this with query selector when we use the CSS selector for um, identifying an element to store as a cached element reference by using a CSS selector. So it's going to be the same thing. It's called a CSS selector because that's what we're using it for. We're using it to select an element by its ID. That's what that little hashtag is. A uh, little note here, IDs on elements should always be unique. We've talked about that before. So what I want you to do, and we can just do this together real quick. Um, we're going to set the size of the font to 28 pixels on the element with an ID of comments title. So if we take a look at our HTML, you'll see that we have an element up here, right here, this H3. Comments title is its ID. We can select that over here with comments right here. You see that if we look on the screen, it says H3 hashtag comments title. That means an H3 with an ID of comments hyphen title. So let's write a CSS rule for that using the hashtag. We're going to write hashtag comments title. And we're going to give that a font size of 28 pixels. And you'll see that that, turn that off. You'll see that that changes. So if we comment it out, small, big, small, right? We also want to give that same element a margin of 10 pixels on the top and bottom and zero on the sides. So here we can use that little shorthand trick I showed you earlier. So margin, and we're going to want, uh, what is it, 10 pixels on the top and bottom, and then zero pixels on the sides. And again, if you wanted to verify that, you could just go over here, click on it, and it tells you all those different properties here. See the margin? You've got 10 pixels on the top and bottom, and none on the left and right. This is your best friend. Tim, what you got? So I noticed that when we set the margins to zero, it actually moves things um, like further towards the margin. So I'm wondering what is the default margin? Um, let's take it out and see. That's for the UL. I uh, can't see the UL. Let's do something like body here. The default is going to be, uh, what's something, here, let's use comments title. That's something I can actually select easily. So comments title, your default margin is 28 on the top, 28 on the bottom. Great. That's coming from font size. Uh, okay. uh, just just to jump in on this too, something that is extremely frustrating that you're going to deal with a lot is uh, these defaults that are here are not going to be the same between different browsers. Uh, so whenever you're going in and thinking about like, oh, I need to set a margin and oh, the default margin on this is cool. I actually don't need to set a margin. Check and make sure, open that in another browser and be like, oh, wait, this browser gives this element a default margin that is wildly off of what I want it to be. So even if it looks good in one browser, open in that next one and double check because oftentimes you're going to be disappointed. Uh, is that it for your question, Tim? Perfect. Darnell? Going back to what David was saying, so that means it changes as well based on screen size, like from a mobile device 
to a tablet, to a desktop. Mm -hmm. Those, that's part of the margins change as well. Yep. We have a whole lecture on mobile responsiveness and um, media yeah. queries next week too. Yeah. So we'll talk all about that. Cool. Any other questions? Claire. Yeah, um, I checked my margin and it's coming up as 28 PX mm -hmm. for the uh, comments title. Yes, and that's if you haven't specified it explicitly. Did you put 10 here? Yes. And it's still showing up as 28? Yeah, um, let me try it without the comma okay that was a problem i put a comma after the 10px Perfect. and now it's fixed okay thank you okay that's a pretty common thing to do uh you're usually when you're listing things in javascript you use commas like you know between things in an array that's a very common error people make when they're doing css for the first time so christopher do you mind just showing again how you like hovered over the comments and sure. told you what tag was. Sure. If you click on this little button right up here, it says select an element in the page to inspect it. You can also use control shift C. You can hover over any element on your page and it'll give you more information just kind of viewing it. And we're going to talk more about specific things you can do with this tool. Like you see that little contrast right there uh, with the little green check. That means that we have a good contrast ratio right now between the uh, background color and the text. And that's going to be important when we start talking about accessibility. Um, but if you click on any of these things, it gives you, if, as long as you're looking at the elements tab in your browser, it'll give you info for all of these different things here. It shows you what your padding is, what your uh, margins are, your border, all that fun stuff. Cool, thank you. We'll often <laughs> call that the magic wand if you hear us trying to get you to use that tool we'll call that the magic wand so keep that in mind tom is there a default color um package for like people that are colorblind uh, we'll talk more about that for when we get to accessibility um that's just it's not really something for this lecture okay cool david uh, yeah, mine's a follow-up. Uh, that control shift C doesn't work for me. And uh, I can only really select the items if I go into the elements and into the, like the individual like div item or something. Do you not have this little arrow button? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, I clicked on it earlier. It didn't work. All right. Yeah, it works. Thanks. Cool beans. Cool. Anybody else? Sweet. Let's move along. Um, so you've seen that we can do the ID selector. We can also take advantage of the class selector. And again, we've seen this when we use query selector, we use the class selector to pick out things that have a different class name. We also use that for query selector all. So the same rules apply here. We're going to select the elements that match one of the values within the class attribute. Yes, the class attribute accepts multiple space separated values. And again, you saw this with the memory game thing that I showed you. If I were to hover over one of these, you see how we have the div hashtag three dot card dot large dot back red. That's indicating that this div has an ID of three and it has three separate class values. It has a class of card, it has a class of large, and it has a class of back red, each of which are responsible for doing different things. So the card is responsible for, as far as this CSS setup is goes, um, the card is responsible for the size of the element. The large, or, or the card is responsible for saying that it's actually just a card. Uh, it's one of the uh, specifiers. If you have card large, it's a different size than like card medium or card extra large. Um, but the card is just one of the specifiers in that chain of, uh, of CSS for getting this stuff to work. And again, we're going to talk about this in the optional CSS card deck lecture. But um, the back red is indicating that the image to display on that card is the SVG image file that looks like the back of a card. Whereas here, we have card large DK, which is card large that indicates the shape of the card and the shape of the div and 
the DK represents that it's showing an image to show the king of diamonds. So each of those classes represents something different. And the specifiers inside of the CSS, I can show you what the CSS looks like for that. So go full screen with this. So this links off to different images, right? There are images included in the directory. This isn't gonna work in this context because the image files aren't here, so I can't actually demo it. But there should be an images directory that has all of these images for it. And when you guys use this card, uh, card deck CSS, I'll show you how to access all that stuff. But essentially what this is saying is, is if I give something a class of card and back red, the background image for that, that div or that element, whatever it is, should be this picture. And the same is true for literally everything else in this file. This is 360 lines of CSS. Each one is showing a different way to put an image on the back of a card. If you want to look at the sizing, it's all set up up here. It's all the sizes do are changing the font size of the card, which in turn will change the actual size of the card because of inheritance. So cool stuff. If you get a chance to dig into this, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. You learn a lot about CSS by playing around with this card starter stuff. I'll share that with you guys later. Oops. That's cool. going to be the card tutorial that you post this weekend. Yeah, I'll, uh, there'll be a little bit of talk about it in that. Um, most of that is already kind of taken care of, but there's, I'm going to do a very detailed walkthrough on that when we actually build a how to flip a deck of cards, shuffle and flip a deck of cards. Uh, it's an optional lecture I do next week for anyone who's interested. But yeah, there'll be enough info in there in my little weekend thing to, to get you through using the card deck should you choose to. Cool. So we're going to use the class selector to set the border of the li element with a class of super cool to be solid, two pixels in width, and red in color. So let's take a look at our HTML and see what we're actually doing here. And if you look what we've got, we're looking for an LI with a class of super cool. So it's gonna be this comment to this one right here. So essentially what we're gonna do is put a border, a solid two pixel wide red border on that element by using this class to select it. So we go back to our style uh, CSS here. We're going to do dot super cool. That's how we select by class. And we're going to type uh, border. We want it to be a uh, two. I always forget the order of this. Two pixel solid red. And that will put. Do we have two classes of super cool? Aha, uh -huh, we do. Thought I made a mistake there for a second. So any item that has a class of super cool, which both of these elements have, it's going to do that two pixel solid red border. Can you put like li dot to make it just that one item? It's the only one within the li. You could. So if you did, if you just wanted the LI, you could do that. Exactly. And we're going to talk about why that works here in a couple bullet points. Mike? Can you scroll it up just a little? <clears throat> because, I mean, uh, it says super cool, but the class names are different. One says super cool, one says crazy super cool. Right. And so it's going to pick up both as long as they contain super cool. Yes. This uh, has two class names. It, it doesn't have one class name of crazy super cool. It has a class of crazy and it has a class of super cool. So you're allowed to use multiple class names. On uh -huh. your so it's just with the space it adds. To mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Got it. Thank you. Not just cool, super cool. Zuri. I would imagine that's the reason for using uh, the kebab case because the space is relevant there. Mm -hmm. um, ben, I'm just curious what, and maybe it's back to the card um, game example, but why would you want multiple classes? 
that's exactly that reason. Sometimes you want some things to inherit properties of one class and something of a different class. So for example, card, because I use the cards for this, everything that has the class of card is going to be this same shape, right? It's gonna be this many pixels tall, this many pixels wide, and it's going to have that same exact shape. That's coming from the card attribute and the large attribute. Uh, or the excuse me, the card class and the large class. What's coming from the background is the back red. That's what's setting the background. So those two different, well, three different in this case classes are making this card look different than this card. So two of the classes are the same on both of these cards. They both have a class of card. They both have a class of large. But because of the third one being different, you're getting a different background image. Okay, that, that makes sense. That's helpful. Thank you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions? This is where stuff starts getting a little complicated. And don't feel like you need to know exactly how all this stuff works right off the bat. Um, I know this can be a little intimidating, but some of the stuff that we use now is going to be more specific ways to target elements directly or other elements or multiple elements. So if this feels a little overwhelming, that's okay. That's, that's normal. Uh, you're not going to need to write CSS like this, like tomorrow. This is something you can practice and work on over time. So uh, again, less common, but handy, you can use the attribute selector. So if I wanted to target an anchor tag, an A tag, that has an href set to hashtag about. This is how you would do that. This is the syntax for that. So you'd use a, and then you'd use the square brackets. And inside of that, the, the attribute that you're looking for, along with an equals, and then as a string, whatever it is that you're expecting as a value for that. So you can actually seek out elements that have specific attributes and specific values for those attributes by using this methodology. Um, really handy if you wanted to find all of your checkbox inputs and style all of your checkboxes or all of your inputs of the type checkbox, right? So if you wanted to find throughout your entire application, all the places where you have a little input that's type checkbox, this is how you would do that. Because the input checkbox has an attribute of type equals checkbox. Does that make sense? Again, this is where we usually start losing people in this lecture. So if, if, that's, if that's confusing, that's completely okay. You'll get it after a little bit. And you're not gonna see this quite as often. Mandy? So like the, the way you would use that is just basically to be like more efficient. So if you have like a lot of stuff that you wanna change, you wouldn't have to go in and like change like the class. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. It's all about keeping your code dry. Don't repeat yourself, right? That's why we have separation of concerns. If you were to do that with inline styling, think about how long that would take. You have to go through every single one of your, like, it's not a big deal when you have one HTML page, but when you load a React app that has 9,000 lines of code in it, and you have like 40 components, you're gonna have to look through each one of those and find what you're looking for. It's easier to just pop it in some CSS. Okay, anybody else have any questions before I move on? Next up, we've got uh, combinators. Is that how you pronounce that? I never, I always thought I was pronouncing that wrong. Cool. Um, this is another powerful way to select elements based on their relationship to other elements. This is where stuff getting, starts getting really wild. So what we can use is the descendant selector. You've seen that before. That's a common one. And that's what we just saw a minute ago when we did the li dot, uh, super cool, right? That finds us an LI element with a class of super cool. So in this situation right here, this h3 dot subtitle span, this is going to match all span tags that are nested anywhere within an h3 tag having a class of subtitle. So this is where this starts getting complicated, right? We've seen this before, but the descendant selector is just putting a space here. So if you put a space, you can find descendants of other elements. What does a descendant mean? 
Somebody try to verbalize that using this code right here. Talk it's to me element. about what a descendant is. Element inside this element, right? Yeah. It's just an element that lives within another element. Within. See how we're opening the LI here and closing the LI here? A descendant of this LI is this UL. It's a box in a box. It's a box in a box. It's boxception. So what I want you to do, Kat? How is that different from parent-child? Same words. Okay, it's the same thing? Yeah. Okay, cool. You'll learn about direct descendant and it's like a couple other pieces of terminology we're gonna to get to in a minute that kind of describe some of the subtle differences between the two, but for all purposes that you need right now, it's- The same thing. In this, yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Literally the next thing on the list. Oh, well, let's do this one first. Using a descendant selector, set the text color of the P tag uh, with the text of, this is a paragraph inside of the third div to dark green and make it bold. So right here, we wanna use that, or we wanna use the descendant selector. So the space between two different things to make this, uh, what, what was the specification? Make the text dark green and bold. So how would we do that? Let's do this together. How do we target this div? Div and then dot class, crazy, super cool. Okay, so we do div dot crazy, super, super cool. cool. And how do we take the get the p tag inside of it? Just put uh, p. Just put p space yeah. p. Exactly. And we said we wanted what color? Dark green. And font weight bold. There we go. So this is looking at the div with a class of crazy and a class of super cool, which is this div, and looking for the descendant inside of it that is a p tag, which is this element right here. Kareem? Um, would it work if you didn't put the div, because since it's, it's the only class crazy super cool, like if you, yeah, like that, would it work? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? Awesome. Um, there are three more combinators uh, that we're not, we don't have specific examples, I don't think here. Oh yeah, we do, we can make these work. Um, the child selector is similar to the descendant selector, but it's only going to match elements that are direct children. So Kat, this kind, kind of comes back to what you brought up earlier, right? If we use the child selector, that's only going to go one level deep as far as nesting goes. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to find all LI tags that are direct children of a ul.top level list element. So let's take a look at our HTML and see what we're actually targeting here. We're looking for direct children of a ul.top level list right? And we want all li tags that are direct children. So that should be this one, this one, and this one. And we're going to make them orange. So to do that, we're going to use dot top level list, because that is the class of what we're using. And we want direct descendants that are LIs, and we're gonna make them orange. You'll notice these are orange as well. We're gonna talk about why here in just a second. Inheritance. Okay. 
Yeah, actually, yeah, look at that. It just says that on the next line. That's what we're going to get to. Kareem, do you still have a question? Cool. Mike? So my um, my allies are not changing to orange, and my, and my um, P didn't change to dark green either. So I'm not sure okay. what. Let's go ahead and check out what you got. Oh, um, you cannot share the screen while the other participant is sharing. Go ahead and try again now. You see that? No. Oh, hold on, sorry. There you go. Um, over here, I have... Before you even do anything, take a look at your linting. See how you have like a trail of little red squiggles? Mm -hmm. they're all initiating from one mistake you've made up top. Take a look at it and see what you think it might be. So it's starting on, looks like it starts on line 25 where you're having problems. So what's the line before line 25? What looks fishy about that line? Line 24 has got something fishy going on. Oh, okay. And as if by magic, that is fixed. Uh and then this you're one. not closing the one above that. So super cool needs to be closed. Gotcha. Thank you. Yay. Cool. Say, so I want to call this out because this is super important. Just like with HTML, if you create errors in your syntax, there's nothing that will tell you that something is wrong besides the linting that you get in this actual document. There's no warnings in the browser. There is no like, hey, you've done this wrong. There's no message of like, hey, go fix this. Uh, your CSS and HTML are both just going to... if make do with what you give them and they're going to fail silently if they fail. So it's really, really important that you're watching your syntax there, that you're um, listening to that linting that you're getting all of that. That's why it makes it difficult to debug this stuff too. Cool. All right. So we've talked about the descendant selector. Let's talk about the adjacent sibling selector. Um, the adjacent sibling selector is a plus. And what that's going to let us do is select tags. This, this one will select li tags only if they were preceded immediately by another li at the same level. So let's go ahead and see what this actually looks like. So let's do li plus li. And we're going to give that a color green. And you're going to see that, well, that green is coming from somewhere else, so you can ignore that one. But this one is the only one that changed. Why is that? OK, so let's take a look it's, here. It's not preceded by another one at the same level because it's the first one? Right, exactly. What about this one? It's not a sibling. They have to be on the same level. It's an ancestor. These two are on the same level, aren't they? That one looks like the opening of uh, another. Is it because there's a um, class? because this, the super cool class was already uh, put in and therefore won't override it? Let's see. Because uh, it's apparent. Let's see if we comment that out if it changes. Aha. So we're getting some confliction here, right? Um, this is a specificity issue. David, you want to mention specificity? Uh, sure. Yeah. So specificity is a, um, fun concept that we have to deal with in CSS, unfortunately, where, um, if you're being more specific about something, then 
uh, that by default is what is going to be applied. Uh, every single rule that you put in here is going to have essentially a specificity score. Uh, this is all part of the level up. I don't want to like dive too deep into this, um, but essentially that's something you have to watch out for uh, whenever you're writing all of uh, your CSS is uh, if you give something a greater specificity then uh, essentially you have the chance of overriding some uh, potential things that you might want to actually be applying. Uh, so that is something just to keep in mind. See the level up for more. Um, I, you most of the time won't be dealing with specificity too much for what you do. So, uh, but it can be like a weird edge case that you run into like what we just saw. Will it mostly deal with uh, whatever came first? So since we did the top level list first and we did the coloring, everything else is just what I, it doesn't matter. So it's not necessarily what's going to be first, but it's what's more specific. So what's going, what's happening here is that you're with the class name on line 34, this top level list, that is what is making this more specific than just selecting the two elements essentially um so because it had because you're specifying the class name there that is more specific uh than just specifying these two elements alone without a class name or anything there so awesome thank you yeah I'm essentially nice. just like real real brief um elements are less specific than class names are less specific than IDs. If I can summarize, you know, all of this in two seconds, that's what I would say to you. Uh, a majority of the stuff that we've gone over today is usually in the level up. So this is just kind of, apparently it got moved. So um, we get to cover it, so it's fun. Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about here is the general sibling selector. And I'm just going to kind of like go through this pretty quickly um, because we're not going to necessarily use it for a while. Um, the general sibling selector is the tilde here. And just like the adjacent sibling selector, this is going to select all instances of the second element that appear after the first element at the same level. Again, very specific use case situation, which is why we usually put it in the level up. It's, um, but if you wanted to do that, you would just put this uh, image tilde P would target all of the P tags that are siblings following an image. So again, very specific rule, like you're probably not gonna need to use this stuff for quite a while. So I wouldn't worry about it too much yet. Okay. Um, I know we got kind of in the weeds there at the end with a lot of really specific stuff, um, but let's let's take away some important things here. Number one, uh, your selectors are going to provide enormous capability and lots of flexibility to target any element you want. There's always going to be a way to target something. Uh, you just have to know the rules for it. And learning those rules is what takes time with CSS. Um, and then figuring out what all the different options are for all the different properties. It's, it takes a while to learn this stuff if you don't uh, already know it. And it, the best way to immerse yourself in it is, like I said, just open up a, a, something in your browser like this and just screw around with it. Open CSS tricks up and just play around. Learn by doing. Don't just read up on it. Actually physically open your browser and do stuff. You're going to learn it a lot faster. Um, this, again, you can use those CSS selectors without having to assign everything an ID, right? It, would it work if you signed everything an ID? Yes, but that's just a lot more work, right? If you know how to select an element based on all of these different uh, methods, these different uh, CSS selectors, it saves you work in the long run. It's, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated code, but it's gonna save you having to like give unnecessary IDs to elements that don't necessarily need them. Um, and as a general note, lean towards using classes instead of IDs. Remember, IDs need to be unique. So you're going to see a lot more styling over the next couple of weeks. Um, and then when we get into further topics, most of the styling is actually going to be provided for you. But dig into that stuff. Open up the style sheets and take a look at what we're doing. And 
when you get absolutely completely baffled, uh, come to me and I'll point you to David and we can go from there. So cool. Um, there's more info in here. I want you guys to just read the rest of this as a level up. That's, I, I think we're, we're at the point now where I think your brains are full of CSS for the day. So if you want more info on here, just read up on this on your own. Sound good? Cool. Uh, why don't we take a, uh, let's do 11 minutes, come back at 2.20, and then we're going to talk about some really fun stuff. We're going to talk about events. It's the lecture that I've been like twitching with anticipatory glee to teach you all day. So come on back at two, well, 2.20 Central, and we'll have some fun. Question. Um, for outcomes, do I just leave or come back later? Or do I gotta let someone know? Just shoot us a message in instructor chat, letting us know you're going to a meeting. We'll be good. Okay.